Christina made it back safely from Poland, by the way. Oh, yeah, thank you. And uh, her and Erica and Felicity and Charlotte are headed up for some uh, ballet things. So she made it back. They came to church at 9. I preached to them for about seven seconds, and they left. That's what happened. And uh, so she didn't make it back. And I had a great trip, and uh, we'll be giving some updates and things. It was very fruitful uh, as they were ministering to Ukrainian refugees who are in Poland. Oh, you know, that also reminds me, in fact, uh, to pray also for Mary Kay Esbach, and uh, who I will get her in the bulletin. She just let me know yesterday that uh, she has a, a broken, which jo a broken arm. I think she had. She took a fall. Shoulder, yeah, shoulder, and uh, so she's going to be out of church for a little while. And uh, John will be tending to her needs. Uh, I told her to make sure that he does. And uh, so, listen. This morning, I want to share with you. I tell you what. I don't know if it's this cold weather. I don't know if it's my allergies or what. But I am really like sort of foggy in the head today. And so that can mean a lot of things for what comes next in a sermon. And uh, so listen, uh, I, I, ha I had a friend of mine one time, uh, we were having a discussion about what is the perfect sermon length. And uh, he said, well, I'll, I don't know, but I know this, I've never heard anybody complain that a sermon was too short. And uh, uh, so I'm not sure, but I'm on a, I, I have to take a fair amount of Claritin today just to keep my head alive. And... Um, so bear with me. We're going to enter into this text, see what the Lord has to say for us, and uh, explore a little bit, plumbing the depths of what I am convinced is the most valuable and probably directly related to the fact of its incredible value is also its scarcity in the Christian life. And that is gratitude. We're going to get into this a little bit. Let's read what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, chapter 5 and verse 5. Here's what the Bible says, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So when we sin, if we confess our sin, he's already forgiven us and stands waiting to pour out the grace commensurate with his loving, bountiful care for us. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 5. Here's what the Bible says. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, this sermon is entitled Failure is Part of the Process. And I'm hoping and trusting that you'll see with great clarity how it is that we might come to embrace our own failures, our own misgivings, our own shortcomings as a directly relevant part of the process of becoming and being a disciple of Jesus. Now, first, let's take a quick informal poll. Who here has ever failed in the process of trying to accomplish something that you really wanted to accomplish? Raise your hand. Anybody? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm reminded of, 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 a, of a, <laughs> something that somebody told me one time that, uh, you know, if they were looking for someone to hire in their business, and this happened to be a person who had operated at very high levels of corporate life, he said, if I was looking to hire someone to manage a certain part of, of this business and I really needed somebody to do it well and I had two resumes on my desk and one was a young man or woman who had gone straight from high school to college to master's level graduate school. They had an MBA, they had a bachelor of business, but all their experience was theoretical because it had all come from college. And I had a guy over here who was a little older who had two failed startup companies and was still passionate about business. He said, I'd hire the guy with two failed startups every day of the week. 
So, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. As an academic, aren't you supposed to respect people with all these college degrees? I have more degrees than a thermostat. I know all kinds of stuff. You know, it's fascinating, though. It wasn't seminary that taught me how to be a pastor, and it most certainly wasn't seminary that taught me how to follow Jesus. It has been the rescue of God in every failed endeavor, in every stumble along the way. There have been lots of times in my life when I failed miserably, and it was the failure that God used to teach me much more than any victory. The example I use most often, I share it with all kinds of people everywhere, I'm almost proud to say that when I was an amateur boxer in middle and high school, I won my first fight. 13 years old, let's call, my, call me at that age less than a robust athlete, you know? I was a little soft. And I went into that boxing ring, I'm 13 years old, I've been training boxing for two weeks, my coaches saw great potential, they said, you, sir, are going into the next tournament. And I won the first fight, because I didn't stop throwing punches for all three rounds. I was so completely exhausted, I wasn't in the kind of shape to be doing that kind of competition, I had just really got off the couch, as it were, and got really invested in athletics. After that, I lost eight boxing matches in a row until I won another fight. And then in high school, I was a state regional champion. I ended up competing for a national championship on my 16th birthday. Happened to get beat up pretty bad for that championship fight, but the point is, I lost eight fights in a row. I was two victories, eight losses in my first 10 fights as an amateur boxer. And because of every loss, that 13-year-old kid he was the first one at boxing practice and the last one to leave because I wanted to win fights so bad. I wanted to accomplish something. And do you know that it was those losses that fueled the future victories? In fact, one of my early boxing coaches, Bob LaCour, a kind of crooked old boxing promoter, he used to use me as an example all the time. Guys would come in with all kinds of natural talent for boxing, and he would say to them, if you had half the heart of Cerber, you'd be a national champion. And I'd always kind of swell up with pride and say, yeah, that's right. Although when I look back on it, it was kind of like a backhanded compliment. <laughs> like, it's too bad Cerber doesn't have any of your talent, or he'd be a national champion. It was the losses. It was the losses that fueled future victories. In fact, it was the most important lessons probably of my entire life that came from those losses. I can't tell you how many times as a 13 and 14 year old kid, I won the most exciting fight of the night award or the sportsmanship award. Every time I'd say, yeah, I sure would rather have the gold medal, thank you very much. You know, when I first moved to Haiti, and I get a lot of compliments from people who don't know better about, hey, you really speak good Creole for a non-Haitian person. Hey, you really learned that language rapidly. Do you know that rule number one, if you want to learn another language, some of us in this room, many of us know this. The first rule that you have to learn if you want to speak a second or now I'm trying to work on a third language, the first rule is you have to accept that you're gonna sound like a fool. You gotta embrace it. You gotta go with it. You gotta lean heavily into it. One of the first times I was trying to use a little Haitian Creole uh, in about 2014, it must have been, and uh, I, was, I was giving a lecture, I was, I was doing a, a week-long seminar for a bunch of Haitian pastors on the topic of expository preaching, because my doctorate happens to be in expository preaching. That means saying what the Bible says. Uh, and uh, so I'm t teaching this lecture, and I wanted to use some of the Creole that I was learning. I was so excited, and uh, I, I started to talk to all these pastors, and uh, I was outside, and I had learned a phrase, okay? I'm going to say this phrase in church. None of you, except for a few Haitian people in here, are going to know that it's not a phrase to be said in church. But you know what? It's like almost a phrase you could say in church, but not quite, because it has all kinds of implications. And so I was telling this story about having a hot rod. 
Mueller knows what I'm about to say, having a hot rod. And uh, the phrase you might say for like a hot rod in Haiti, you say it called a zo machine. And so I was outside and this guy had pulled up. You could also use it very sarcastically. A man had pulled up in this like chitty chitty bang bang mobile that was like completely falling apart. And this old Haitian man, he looked across, he, he pointed with his lips. Haitian people are the only people I've ever seen point with their lips. You know what I'm talking about? And he looks at this, this, this chitty chitty bang bang mobile, this truck that's like literally falling apart. And he goes, zo machine. So it means like hot rod, but on the street, it means something a little closer to like sexy car. You can use it in some other ways that aren't so good to be spoken of in church. Now I'm in church trying to use the Haitian Creole that I had, and I went to tell this story to the people, and I said it, and all these pastors, half of them started laughing to tears, and the other ones were like, oh, mm-mm-mm. And, th and then my translator, who was upset at me for leaving the translating, and going off on my own when I didn't have the Creole for it, he says, hey, 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 you can't say that in church. You know what, though? That day, all of those mostly men, there was a few women there as well, they all clearly appreciated that I was making attempts to communicate to them in their mother tongue, in their heart language, and I have said more things in Haitian Creole than I care to admit that were so wrong because the sound is so close to another sound. If you want to speak another language, you have to be willing to sound like a fool. Failure is part of the process of being and becoming a disciple of Jesus. Today, God accepts every one of us exactly as we are and not as we should be because this side of heaven, none of us shall ever be exactly as we should be. Now, that doesn't mean that God's not going to continue the process of cleaning us out, of refining us, of conforming us into the image of his son, making us more and more disciples of Jesus who act like apprentices of our master and live sacrificially, lovingly, the way that he exemplifies, commands, and enables. Last week we talked a little bit about accepting the acceptance of God, and I wanted to go a little further into this idea because I think this may be the barrier emotionally, spiritually, psychologically that holds a lot of us back from accepting the acceptance of God and really learning how to fall in love with Jesus and experience the divine presence in our life. Accepting the acceptance of God isn't just a general principle. It's the application of the principle of love from God in our lives, especially in times of failure. Have you ever failed doing something for God or fallen back into that same habitual pattern of, uh, of, of living that you know is destructive, that you know isn't good for you, and then in those moments felt like God was far from you? Listen, he is ever nearer in our times of failure than in our times of victory because there is the opportunity for us to recognize in our failure and in our brokenness to develop a hunger for discipleship, to want to grow closer to him because of the awareness of our own misgiving, but instead of allowing our failures and our brokenness to drive us to the gym of worship, to drive us to the, to the workout of the word of God, of studying his word, of the workout of living out our faith. You Usually, when we fail, we tell ourselves the lie. We believe the lie of the, the diabolical one, our enemy, that says, look at you. You're a hypocrite. You failed. You'll never live up. You'll never be what God called you to be instead of listening to that voice that comes from the outside or our own toxic voice that comes from the inside from so many of the lies that we've already believed in our lives. Learn in times of failure to recognize that failure is a part of the process. Don't go out seeking sin or trying hard to mess up. I remember when I first became a believer 
and I was 16 years old at Calvary Temple uh, Assemblies of God in Modesto, California. And Assemblies of God churches really commonly, very regularly, have evangelists that come in because they want to stir up the, the congregation, right? The pastor, when he doesn't feel like he's hearing enough amens and hallelujahs, He brings in an evangelist to get everybody fired up. And I remember one time I was, I was almost 17 years, maybe by that time I was 17. I was just a kid. I was a brand new Christian, really. I've been, as, as, as many of you know, I've been reading the Bible, but never been in church most of my life. I'm just trying to understand it. And uh, I was in this church. And I was like on fire for the Lord. God had, had, in, had, had, Jesus had ambushed me and the Holy Spirit had, had, had done a home invasion into my heart. And, and I, and I was like on fire for the Lord. And this evangelist came through and he started telling all of his stories. He had been like a pimp. He had been like a murderer. He was, a, and, 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 and then everybody loved this guy because then he would talk about he was talking about what God had done to transform his life and I remember at 17 I was like man I'm kind of messed up and I think God's called me to be a preacher but I don't have a really cool story like him I've never been like in prison I've been arrested a few but whatever but I never I wasn't like him and I remember having this thought, oh gosh, maybe I need to go out and do some really proper sinning in my life so that I can be a great preacher like this guy. Listen, I'm not saying celebrate failures. I'm not implying that it's a, that, that, that a kind of antinomianism, that means against law. I'm not saying that, that God doesn't have any kind of boundaries on our life, but what I'm saying is those boundaries exist for our benefit. In other words, Jesus, when he says, come follow me, get on this path, pick up your walking stick, strap on your sandals, and, and, and march after me, like he said to the disciples, tromping out the dust all over the Galilee, he says, this is the way because this is the way of life, not condemnation. Learn to accept that in moments of failure, be they moral or otherwise, be they sins of commission or omission where we withdraw from being our highest selves that God equips us to be, that in those moments of failure, he is present that in those moments of failure, when it feels like he's far away, that is not him removing his spirit. That is us believing the lie that we're supposed to be perfect and that somehow he won't love us if we're not. The with God life is about accepting the acceptance of God. And here is the key ingredient, I think, from three passages of scripture from the Psalms I'm going to share with you. We're going to conclude And that key ingredient is gratitude. In times of failure, in times of mistake, in times of, of falling away, we must learn to hear the central idea of at least these three passages of Scripture and a whole theme and, and motif that is consistent with this running throughout the Bible so that when we did it again, the self-destructive pattern, whatever it is for you. We fell back into judgment of others because growing up we never thought we were enough, so we want to elevate ourselves by way of pushing others down. That's one example. We grew up in a chaotic family, and we find ourselves slipping back into that chaos. We grew up around a lot of turmoil. Maybe our life has confronted us a lot. Now that anger is coming back out. It is in those very moments that the teaching of God, that the presence of the Holy Spirit is most capable to work in us, not the least. It is in the moment of failure that we have the decision to make. Will I believe what the Bible says about me and God's love for me, or will I believe those lies? Sometimes our downtrodden soul drags us into the waters of self-condemnation. The wounds inflicted upon us by the world, by others, or by ourselves. Those wounds, when left untreated, leak a kind of toxic, gangrene in the spirit realm, poison that leads to self-condemnation. The way out isn't to get away from the memories of these things. 
The way out isn't to, to try to medicate ourselves into some other way of thinking. It is to accept that the heart of Jesus burns for you, longs for you, is present within you to love you with the fullness of acceptance of his love. I remember when I lost that second boxing match, a part of me didn't want to go back to boxing. And my dad, who did precious few things to shape me in a positive direction, who mostly passed on the brokenness he had inherited, made me go back. It may have been the only thing that man ever did for me that was truly soul-shaping to force me to go back. But when I did, I fell in love with training because I loved the art of the training. Listen, in the moment of failure, it's a lie that you're a failure. In the moment of despair, it is a lie that you were created for despair. In the moment of failure, that is the very time. They say the most important time to train. They say this in the martial arts, in weightlifting, in, in sports. The most important time to train is the day you didn't want to. In the moment of failure, that's not the time to go deeper into the despair. It's the time to wake up to the fact that if his love is present for us all the time, everywhere, then it's especially available in those times where our hearts are broken, up, broken open, broken up by our own knowledge of our own imperfection. That's where the amen and the hallelujah would come in, by the way. Just saying. Feel free to let it out. I know some of you are holding it in. I know it. I know some of you. I can see it on your face. Oh my gosh. It's all right. Sometimes they refer to traditions like ours as the frozen chosen. We know we were chosen before the foundation of the earth by the grace of God. So we just rest in that. Let it out once in a while. I know you want to. All right, here's three quick thoughts. Psalm chapter 50 and verse 23 says it this way, Give thanks. Giving thanks is a sacrifice that truly honors me. That's what God says. If you keep my path, I will reveal to you the salvation of God. What is the sacrifice spoken of here? When we give gratitude to another being, be that God or someone in our lives of a, 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 what the Navajo people call two-legged creatures, uh, another person, uh, if we give gratitude when we express thanks, what is the sacrifice? The sacrifice is pride. We're cutting the lamb of pride that lives inside of us. We're spilling its blood. We're laying it on the altar to God and we're offering up the scent of the incense of gratitude. Giving thanks to God is acknowledgement of my lack of self-sufficiency. That's why we need the gratefulness spoken of in this passage. We need to cultivate a heart of gratitude. Right at the heart of being able to see my failure as opportunity for God to increase me, for God to reshape me, right at the heart of that is gratitude. In my failure, in the moment of failure, you blew up again, you, you, you freaked out again, you, 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 you fell back into that same sin you've been dealing with since you're seven, or 17, or 70. In that very moment of knowledge of the conviction of sin, which the Holy Spirit will do to us, to let us know we're, we're, we're not living as at the high frequency, let's say, that God has called us to live. We're not expressing the love of Jesus. We're not resting in the love of Jesus. You know, I love the passage of Scripture that says uh, that the only labor that is good for a person, uh, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 11, let us therefore strive to enter into that rest so that no one may fall into the same sort of disobedience. In other words, the only striving, the only labor in the Christian life spoken of in the New Testament is laboring to enter into rest, working harder to go to the place where we don't work hard, we rest in the grace of God and let that become the fuel of our life. C.S. Lewis put it this way, he said, gratitude exclaims very properly how good of God 
to give me this. That 13-year-old gave me a great gift. Sometimes I think he was wiser than I am today. That 13-year-old said, thank you for the losses because they fuel me with a desire to grow. And he showed up five to 50 minutes early and wouldn't leave the gym until the coach turned the lights off. And to this day, I am grateful for the losses because it is in the losses that I learned that there is opportunity to grow if I would but be grateful for the opportunity and if I would allow the Lord to work in my life. Gratitude takes the emphasis off of me, my prideful attitude that is upset with myself and becomes self-condemning and puts it on the giver of life. Psalm 118 and verse 24 says, This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Follower of Jesus, you ever sing that song? We just sang it a few weeks ago. I sing because I'm happy. You know the song? Let's sing one verse of it. I sing because I'm happy. Say, just sing it. You know, none of you sing any worse than I do. I sing because I'm happy. You know, sometimes we sing that song and I'm like, hogwash. I'm not happy today. I'm happy today, but I'm just saying sometimes. And I'm reminded of the words of that old preacher, Paul Killingsworth, that old Pentecostal pastor of mine 30 years ago in Yuma, Arizona, 26 years ago. He used to say, we don't sing because we're happy. We're going to worship our way right into the joy of the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. The pathway out of brokenness, out of depression, out of despair, the way out is to count the blessings that are present in our lives and to be grateful for everything the Lord is doing and is working even in the broken things. Because I have found, the Bible declares, and I have observed in the life of many thousands of saints, that it is the grateful heart that rejoices, that recognizes even my failure today may be the very thing God is using to bring victory in my life tomorrow. Psalm chapter 136 and verse 1 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Follower of Jesus, child of God, listen. Gratitude is the antidote for self-condemnation and failure. Not at a later time when things are better, but in the very moment of failure, learn to praise your way out of the failure. Thank you, God, for allowing me to slip and fall down. I'm going to be stronger because of it. D.L. Moody put it this way, and I'll conclude with his thought. Careful for nothing, prayerful for everything, thankful for anything. We're going to mess it up. We're going to embarrass ourselves. That's okay. To this day, I like to think I have this robust ability to speak uh, Haitian Creole. And every now and then I paint myself into a corner and I run out of words and I just have to give it my best shot. So it is in our life, spiritually. They say in Haiti, Creole pale, c'est Creole comprend. Creole spoken is Creole understood. What's the implication? In the spiritual life, it is not the one who does it perfectly that does it best. It is the one who does it. Amen.